what is re-photography? G'day and welcome to Forgotten Tasmania. I'm John Stevenson. To be honest, I didn't think there was much more to re-photography after you'd said then and now photos. I thought that kind of wrapped it up. But there's so much more to it, and I'd like to tell you about that today. I like to start with Wikipedia, because that'll give me a good overview of a topic, with some degree of fact-checking. And according to Wikipedia, re-photography is the process of photographing a subject again after a period of time has passed. In my case, that means taking an original beady photo, finding the exact spot where it was taken, and making a new photograph that shows how things have changed, but more importantly, how they've stayed the same. Wikipedia suggests that re-photography dates back to the 1850s, but their examples are about using 1850s photos and re-photographing them, rather than work that was actually done in the 1850s. But by the 1880s, there was certainly re-photography work happening a lot. Wikipedia does give us a useful statement about the social use of re-photography. Repeat photographs offer subtle cues about the changing character of social life, it says. It seems re-photography can be a kind of social tool as well. Some re-photography is very casual, taken from the same spot but without regard to timing, season or weather. But some is really precise, involving a thorough study of the original image and some serious mathematics. And that's what my good friend Dr Jim Palfreyman does. So, when you give me a photo, the first thing I do is I study it very closely and I try and work out what time of year we're looking at first. Um, that's actually really important because it helps with the angles of the shadows because if you can get the same uh, time of day and date of year and the location as well, spot on, the photo, the reproduction will pop. It will look really, really good. If you're slightly off, I found it's just not quite as good. To get the uh, seasons, you sort of look at the trees and you can get a glimmer of when it's summer or winter or whatever or what the people in the shot might be wearing. Then I look, once I've worked out the, the season, then I'll look at the shadows. Hopefully there's a shadow there. And that then gives me the angle of the sun. And I can, from the angle of the sun, if, I, if it's a location I know precisely, I know where that shadow is and I can work out the time of day. Unless there's a clock in the background. We've been a bit lucky with some recent shots. There's been a, a clock to help us. But when there's no clock there, the angles of the shadows... I can um, you know, use my astrophysics and, uh, and work out the time of day, uh, usually to within you know, um, you know, half an hour or so, and that's usually enough. Okay, so in winter, <clears throat> the sun rises sort of fairly low in the northeast and sets in the northwest. In the high summer, it rises uh, in the southeast and sets in the southwest and goes quite high in the sky. So... If you know the season, if let's pretend it's winter, I know the sun is generally pretty low in the sky at that time. And then, and I've got some apps that can help me along as well. I can dial up the, you know, the, where the sun might be in the sky and, and help me as well. So if you can get the season, that really, really helps because you know, it, it could be midday in winter or nine o'clock in, um, in summer. But having said that, even uh, at noon, forgetting daylight saving, because most of our shots, there's no daylight saving anyway. So... At noon, we know the shadow will be pointing south, so I can sort of, if I know where south is in the photo, I can use that as a guide to work out the time. Pretty much like a sundial, really, to be honest. The app I like to use is um, Sunseeker. It's a fairly simple and, and cheap app, but it has the ability that you can dial up any time or date and see where the sun is in the sky. But the other nice little feature is you can hold the phone up and, it'll, and it, you can see, and it'll show you where the sun is, even if it's behind clouds. And that's really handy, and that can sort of help me just get the numbers right. I could go away and calculate them myself. So the way I find the spot, I, I think the spot is actually really important because if you actually get it down to within you know, 10, 20, 30 centimeters, it will make a massive difference. And so what I tend to do is, is it's, I try and line things up. And it's fantastic when you've got old buildings. I remember standing uh, what, was, what is a roundabout now in Salamanca, lining up one of the shots. And I, and I found some old buildings. There was a chimney pot and a corner of a building that were in the original photo. And I could get a precise alignment in the original photo. And all I had to do was move around until the corner of that building, that chimney pot, lined up. And I knew I was in the right spot, give or take, you know, unless the a bit of road height or something had changed. And I was in the middle of the road. <laughs> so um, it was a bit tough then. But um, yeah, so yeah, lining things up when you've got old buildings, uh, that really helps. When you've got 
you know, lots of scenery and bush and rivers and, and stuff that we've done on the Derwent River. Uh, then it comes down to, again, hills. You know, you sort of try and line up the, the hills or something close and a hill in the distance to help as well. So uh, anything to line that up is is what I'll do. It's, sometimes it's pretty hard to, to get the exact spot if you don't have those reference points. When we were doing um, the CML building, or just near the CML building, um, I was using some windows on the other side of the street and I, we found out I couldn't actually get in the right position. So it was a bit of a shame with that particular one. I couldn't just quite get there um, for health and safety reasons. But uh, it's fun trying to find those. I like that challenge to get the, the exact spot. When we did Franklin Square, uh, I, that was one of the very first ones that I did. And uh, I did that one because it, we had a clock and I knew the time and from the bushes and everything around, I could pick the time of year. And so I thought, oh, this will be an easy one. So I went down to Franklin Square and got where I thought we were, but of course the trees had all changed and the streets had changed a bit and things had changed and it was hard to line up in the end. And I took a shot at the time, that was the very first one, and it was, it was good, it was a good shot, but it turns out it wasn't in the right place and I was not happy. So um, I made you come back and we, we had another shot, another shot at it. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, it took me, I think it took me about 20 minutes to decide, we're taking lots of shots where the actual camera position was, just trying to find something in the photo that I could line up. Uh, unfortunately, it was it was hard because the tre the trees that were you know tiny little skinny things back when the photo was taken were these massive trees now and blocking things and blocking buildings. Um, but in the end, I, th I think we got that one in the end, and uh, yeah, it was uh, quite a nice shot. I was really pleased with that one. When we did Cascade Gardens, that was a challenge and a bit of a disappointment. Yeah, and that finding the spot was really hard because of our friends, the trees, but also because there'd been a lot of redevelopment down there and uh, they'd changed it a lot. And uh, that that was actually, it was a fun day trying to find it, but a little bit frustrating because there were times we thought we'd had it and then we looked and, and lined things up and it wasn't quite right. And we moved another you know, 400 meters up the you know, up the path and it was still, we, you know, we weren't 100% sure. And that was because the context of the shot uh, was really hard. All we had was a river uh, or a creek with some rocks in it. And so I was trying to find the rocks. It might sound strange that you think the rocks in a creek might not change very much over 100 years, but you know they might not. But of course, there'd been redevelopment and, and possibly even redirection of the rivers and lots and lots of new trees. So yeah, that was a hard one. And so I think I found the spot in the end, but it was so different. I think it was probably not quite what we wanted, but uh, it was fun. So sometimes it's actually impossible to get to the spot exactly because things have changed. And probably my favorite one of this was the one of the bridge over in Lindisfarne. And I went hunting and looking and I you know, sort of was driving up streets and moving along. And, and then I got to this spot and I realized, oh, this is where he was very closely. And there was the spot that I needed to be. There was a house there. So what do you do? You knock on the door. So I, Pulled my uh, my business card out and uh, knocked on the door, and this this guy answered the phone, uh, answered the door, and uh, said, "Look, I said I apologised for you know intruding, and I said, look, I'm I'm a photographer, and this is the work that I'm doing, blah 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 blah, and it turns out that this photo, and I had the photo with him, I could show it to him, was taken from right where your house is now, and he goes, come on in, and he brings me in, and uh, up on the wall in his house was the photo because he'd found it somewhere else and uh, he had it there. So that was really good. And he was absolutely happy for me to stand on his deck and reproduce it as well. So that was that was a good moment, actually. It was, uh, yeah, you know, people can be really helpful like that sometimes. So uh, my start in photography was, uh, Dad had a film SLR and he, he um, I can't remember the brand, but I've got the camera. I've still got the camera that Dad had. Uh, he handed it to me uh, when, and taught me how to use it when I was probably about eight years old. And so, and I learned quite quickly how to, um, you know, and it was completely manual, no automatics. He taught me how to use the light meter and all that. So I, it was all black and white back then. And, and he also taught me how to develop and print my own black and white film. So I did a little bit of that when I was um, young. You and I met at, uh, at college and uh, I did some work with your dad in the studio for a month, a bit of work experience, part of it taking photos of Father Christmas, but also being in the lab. And, and I learned a little bit of stuff from him. And I, I, the thing I probably learned the most um, was the, his lighting setup and how he did it. And that was because amateurs worry about equipment, professionals worry about money, masters worry about the light. Your dad worried about the light and that was I learned that lesson from him. Mr Beattie re-photographed scenes other photographers before him had taken. 
and when he couldn't re-photograph, he commissioned an artist, Horton Forrest, to recreate the scene with a paintbrush. I like to put things in the recreations that were there in the original, like cars, bikes, buses, cruise ships, and of course a camera bag in honour of my grandfather. I don't think Pop invented re-photography, but he was certainly redoing Mr Beattie's shots as far back as the 1930s. Pop was a portrait photographer from Launceston, and he was lured to Hobart by Mr Beattie as part of his retirement planning. But once Pop saw Beattie's landscape work, I think he caught the bug, because most of Pop's work is landscape photography, and he left the portrait work to my father. Pop is remembered for his photos of the bridges across the Derwent River, the floating bridge, the two bridges, and the Tasman Bridge. Copies of these photographs hang in many Tasmanian homes, even 50 years after Pop's passing. A lot of re-photography is very sad, like we've lost something. I'm a bit of an oddball there. Mine are more a celebration that the wilderness or the old buildings are still there. Sometimes I celebrate progress. Same building, different attitude, social structure, progress, more civil rights, or whatever. There's some great buildings and things, but who wants to live in colonial Van Diemen's land with the disease, hunger, convicts, and the way we treated Aboriginal people? The fashion is great to look at, but who wants to wear a whalebone corset? Although I would wear a Victorian era suit if I wasn't so worried about what people would think of me. The advent of the smartphone putting a highly capable camera in everyone's pocket has revolutionised re-photography. For example, the police regularly collect smartphone photos from a crime scene, along with security camera footage to check the timeline. My wife started photographing the kids in our family every Christmas. She'd pose them all in order of age on the couch. Over the years, babies came along and older ones weren't able to make it because they had families of their own. But we have a great record of them growing up. And I can say to my son, see, your cousin didn't grow tall until he was 17, so there's still time for you. Rephotography has been used in documentary films. They fade the photo to reveal what stood in this place, not that long ago. There's even organised rephotography projects where the public is encouraged to photograph scenes and submit their photos for a 4D timeline. There's a big project called Retake Melbourne, and I dare you to visit Abbey Road and not grab a selfie on the pedestrian crossing. So re-photography is really popular, we just don't call it by that name. It's just having a bit of fun doing a then and now photo. I use an app called Photos Then and Now. It lets me overlay the live camera with the historic photo. I can line them up and fade between the two. I've tried a few apps, but Photos Then and Now seems to work pretty well. It'd be nice to have a few more manual camera controls, but you know, I can add lenses and things like that to the iPhone if I really have to. You can try re-photography too. Download a photo from our website, get the Photos Then and Now app or, or another one, and it's really easy, especially if you know the place where the photo is, like if it's of your own house. I've had plenty of people with older houses buy a beady photo to hang on the wall next to their modern photo. They make great conversation pieces. I think that's one of the biggest reasons people buy beady photos today. And you can still buy beady photos from our website. So there you have it. I learned a lot about re-photography making this episode, and I hope you got something out of it too. I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers!